This is the Athletic Football Show. Welcome to the Athletic Football Show. I'm Robert Mays. Joining me today is my good friend, Nate Tyson. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing wonderful. We had Tampa Palooza. All the stars came out. We had, we had Les. We had Howie. We had Trent. All the guys, all the guys came out today. So it was it was a good day one. Raucous day one. No, so I'm doing wonderful. It's a it's a good, good start to free agency. I'm glad we get to do these live in the heat of it. There's like a lot going on. Supported. I don't a know. Lot. If I'm just misremembering how it's gone the last couple of years when we did this. This it seems like there's more happening. And as I said earlier today, my, my lip is all bleeding now. As I said earlier today, a lot going on. I there's so much happening. My nerves are so frayed, and part it's partially because I've had I'm just Ken stuck in my head since like 10 p.m. last night. That's and good. so there's there's just a lot happening to my synapses right now with all the stimuli from today. So if I just go off the rails at any point, know that it's because I've been enduring a lot over the last 20 hours or so. How is structuring the notes? That was fun. I don't even know how I managed to do it. Everything was rolling in at different times. So if this feels all over the place, it's because this day has been all over the place. But we are going to start with the biggest domino that we were all waiting to fall. I mean, this is the discussion at the Combine last week. This was going to be the biggest kind of moment that happened early in free agency to dictate how the quarterback market will go, how certain teams decided to spend. And that is Kirk Cousins officially landing with the Atlanta Falcons on a four-year deal worth $180 million per Tom Pelissero, $100 million guaranteed, $50 million signing bonus, as Diana said, $45 million per year in 2024 and 2025. This is a massive deal for Kirk Cousins, but not necessarily a surprise. It's a natural markup on the Kirk on the Derek Carr deal. It's in the same range as the Daniel Jones deal. And this is why it was always going to be difficult for the Vikings to keep him because there was going to be some team that was looking at a short-term window and was needing an upgrade that was willing to go to this place for Kirk Cousins. And Atlanta absolutely made sense when that market started to form here over the last few weeks. Yeah, the the car deal, the his previous deal, you know, part duh. Like this just feels like his last extension, just the again, you know, with some natural market inflation, you know, with the cap going up and everything. And I think Greg Rosenthal. Uh, uh, from NFL Network put it best where he said uh, uh, essentially the Daniel Jones deal with a little bit of inflation and then that little $10 million sweetener. It's like a two-year deal plus one. Mm -hmm. Like it's a two plus one kind of deal. So when you break it down that way, yeah, this makes total sense. That's exactly, he is going to get whatever the cap of this market was or the top of this market and that's what it is. It's the natural progression of the last one he signed. So this this is a great pick for him because of the young talent the Falcons have with a workable offensive line as well, which I'm sure Kirk Cousins has a lot of experience with not so workable offensive lines in Minnesota. Had a decent one last year, though. Um, decent weapons with Drake London, Kyle Pitts, hopefully fully healthy, B. John Robinson. It should be a strong run game. The play action, the offensive system, there is no translation needed. This is the offense he's been in for his entire life uh, as a professional. So, I think it's uh, makes total sense, and the money makes total sense, and it makes sense for the Falcons as well, wanting that type of upgrade and where they're selected in the draft. This makes all the sense in the world. Like you said, Zach Robinson is their offensive coordinator, comes from Los Angeles, obviously, where Kevin O'Connell came from, so it's going to be shared language, shared ideas. It's going to be a very easy transition for him. My only thought about this is now you're going for the immediate upgrade route rather than the theoretical upside route in the draft. You have the eighth overall pick. Could you have been in range to go get the fourth quarterback or trade up for one of these other quarterbacks? Them not deciding to do that lets me into their thinking that they didn't love those guys, maybe beyond that first tier of quarterbacks. And so by going to get Kirk here, you're giving yourself a two-year window, essentially, to maximize the savings you're getting on some of those young draft picks. Kyle Pitts is still cheap. Drake London's still cheap. So now when you're going to have to eventually pay those guys, you're probably going to have to transition to a cheaper quarterback. Yep. Whether you can do that if you're a borderline playoff team and you're picking in the 20s, that's the existential question all of these teams have to face when you're going for the short-term upgrade. It's going to be hard to pivot away from this, but it doesn't seem like that's the most important thing on the Falcons' agenda. And uh, um, yeah, Chicago gets a decent amount of construction. I know we do in Las Vegas is, you know, building new off ramps are expensive and this is, that's what you're doing. You're just building yourself off ramps every year going like, okay, in two years, we'll, 
we'll make sure is there a guy we can transition to or we do one on one, you know, like with an old guy and a young guy. OK, but all right. At least we give ourselves space for a season or two and, and just have an answer there to have backups on the roster. Uh, you know, it's like so it's like, OK, at least we could just get off the, the carousel that we see all these other teams getting on. That's what that's what this is the price you have to pay for that. Seems like the best case scenario here is what's going on with Jared Goff in Detroit, right? Goff is only $30 million a year for the last couple of years, but we've obviously had a huge $50 million ish spike in the cap. So you're in a general similar range where it's, you know, the back half of the top 10 in terms of quarterback pay. And that's worked out well for the Lions, but that's yep. a tough tool to threat. You need really good offensive coaching. You need to be, have guys put very much into the best positions. You need to get the most out of your cheap skill position talent or your cheap pieces, period, the way that the Lions have. So I, mm -hmm. I think you're trying to find a model that's put you that where the Falcons, if they want to, the team that's in a position where the Falcons want to go, I would say it's what has happened with the Lions here over the last couple of years in acquiring Jared Goff in the direction they've gone from there. Yeah, I, they're a little further along than when Goff got there. Uh, the, yeah, the for sure. Are. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So this is more like this year of of the Lions and Goff and sure. everything. That's, I, I think, because that's what the Falcons obviously want to push. You don't sign Kirk Cousins to kind of go like, yeah, nine and eight, 10 and seven. No, this is the push and get a top two seed, you know, host and host a playoff game. You know, this is the type of thing you want to do. The question now, now what for Minnesota? You missed out. Which direction are you ultimately going to go? Diana reported that Sam Darnold could be a bridge target for them, which makes sense. You know, if does. they're not going to go for the guy who's going to be a needle mover in the way that Kirk is, you might as well shop all the way at the other end of the market if you want a stopgap guy. But eventually, they're going to need to go get a quarterback. They're going to you know, need to go get a long-term answer at quarterback. Jefferson, Hawkinson, Derisaw, all those guys that are 25 to 27 right now. You're going to want the guy who is your plan, your long-term plan in there sooner rather than later. So in your mind, does that missing out on Cousins potentially give them even more urgency to try to come away with somebody in the top 10 of this year's draft? It's nice that they have a natural stopgap in Darnold, I guess. If they like a guy, though, I think they got uh, they commit to it. You know, if they like if they think they have an avenue to even get like a Drake May, now I'm just talking about J.J. McCarthy or Jane Daniels, you know, the non Caleb guys, if they feel like they have an avenue to get into that range. And I know it's silly season right now. And it just seems you don't know who everybody likes, but everything, but everyone is, you know, negging Drake may right now, like a bad pickup artist. So that makes <laughs> me think that he's everybody's guy, uh, you know, with everything like going on, but getting into that position. Yeah. If they like the guy, if they don't, then I don't know. I've, I've, I've been a big believer in just like, don't do it just to do it. You know, that's mm -hmm. why you sign the Darnold to the world. Maybe you get a Gino out of that. You know, that's what you're, you know, that's the new term for that. Maybe, Oh shoot. Or a Baker kind of situation like that's the dream if not okay well then we get back to uh back to it next year and we have a workable contract with darnold and you know maybe we get through the season just go through that so i don't think they have to like absolutely have to if they think they have a plan with these other guys these other guys being darnold or just whatever have you jacoby Brissett of the world i never want you to take one just to do it but my concern always with that well you know we'll find workable quarterback play and let's say darnold's pretty good and then you are 10 and 7 and you're picking 18th again in a bad quarterback. It's again, it just get puts you in a spot where it's going to be Maybe. harder and harder to find your guy. It, this is a, again, the existential question facing a lot of these teams that are having to find imperfect answers at quarterback. And this is always, this is always going to be the case with Minnesota when they kept rolling with Kirk. It was always going to be difficult to find that off ramp in the terms that you used. And that seems to be exactly where they are again. So yeah. how they come out of this offseason quarterback wise is going to be one of the next big questions that we're going to have to answer. Let's stick aggressive. with the quarterbacks very quickly here. Russell Wilson signs a one year, $1.2 million vet minimum deal to stick with the Pittsburgh Steelers. We talked about this last week and whether or not this made sense. And you don't love the fit with Arthur Smith, but it, it just seems like they're willing to bet on the value here. It's $1.2 million. It. Who gives a shit? And I guess I kind of understand that. But at the same time, my reaction to this, even I'm, I hate that I'm doing this. This feels like something like Bill Simmons would have done like five years ago. I'm going to compare this to like fantasy football spending. This to me feels like the guy in your fantasy football auction who saved all of his money till the end. And yeah, he picked off a guy for like a decent price, but you still need the good players to win. So right. that's kind of what this feels like to me. It just feels like a 
a convenient half measure where they don't have to spend anything. But what are the 2023 Steelers with Russell Wilson? I, I still think not enough is how I come away from this, even if you're paying him absolutely nothing. He's there, you know, there's about a half dozen to eight quarterbacks that Russell Wilson was better than last year, and Kenny Pickett was one of them. Uh, as the as and that was that's the downside. Maybe that's if enough. You, it, Maybe that's, that's enough. I know that's the downside if you if you miss out on the quarterback contract too. Is the is the Kenny Pickett's of the world now? You're shopping in the Russell Wilson aisle. The I, I just there's that I don't want to overblow it, but I do want to bring it up that I just don't think it's a perfect fit because Sean Payton last year is would be running a similar offense to what I think Arthur Smith would be running, not identical, mm-hmm. but similar type of attack and similar flavors. So it's like I already kind of seen this. I've seen the training wheels with it. And I've seen the limitations and what the strengths will be, which will be it'll be deep balls. It'll be a lot of stuff to the outside, and George Pickens will get fed. I, I and it'll be a ton of run game. It'll be a ton of checkdowns to running backs, especially on third down. <laughs> oh, excuse me. And so that's why I just have hesitations with it. But again, it's like whatever you know, workable, like fine, like he's replacement level starting quarterback. He's fine. He's fine. That's what he is now. But it's just you don't have that crazy upside or crazy bursts of good play that you maybe expect with the signing. Or yeah. Result. The lack of upside is, I guess, where I just am left a little bit cold by this. It's like, okay, yeah. I understand it by doing this. You're allowing yourself to continue to operate on a rookie quarterback financial timeline yep. while giving yourself options and competition at the position, which is objectively a good thing right. to have as a team building measure. But at the same time, I just don't know what it really does for you in the short term. And when you look at what the Steelers are, especially on defense, like those guys aren't getting any younger. We've talked no. about this. So while it is objectively a good move for the value, I just don't know how much it moves, what your chances look like and how competitive you are in the short term. It is a smart move. It, it is a smart yeah. bet organizationally, it, but I'm just left very unmoved by it. The upside feels like the similar to last year, but just like a little cleaner results. Like it'd be like the same results as this year, but just like, oh, okay. They didn't have as much luck bounce their way as far as injury stuff, you know, from other teams and everything. So that's what I'm saying. It feels like a nine and eight ish upside move, 10 and seven upside move and getting it does six or seven, which is their natural upside. Anyway. That's it. So that, that's, that's it. why it just doesn't more, feel more like it's moved anything for no, me. No, no, it's more about the needle. Same, exactly the same. That's yeah. Last quarterback move to hit here. Baker Mayfield signs a three-year, $100 million extension with the Bucks. $50 million guaranteed. They can get out of it after one year and about $40 million. The big question for Baker, and Diane and I hit this several different times when we were talking about him over the last couple of weeks, including at the Combine, was where is this going to fall in the range of the Geno Smith deal and the Daniel Jones deal? And the answer is pretty close to the Geno Smith deal. Yep. Geno's had not nearly as much guaranteed at signing. So the Seahawks theoretically had an easier out after year one. But overall, this feels like a pretty natural markup for inflation on what Geno Smith got from the Seahawks, even if they're probably committed to him for more than a year. And I think if you're the Bucks, that's fine. Yeah. As long as signing Baker and bringing Baker back doesn't preclude you from trying to chase a long-term option, maybe as soon as next year in the draft, then I'm totally fine with this. You're trying to compete in the short term, but you're not cutting off avenues for yourself to higher upside play at the position starting in 2025, maybe at the earliest. And I think that is okay. So I'm it, fine with them doing this. It's a, uh, maybe we can get hot signing. Yeah, that that's it. And living in this world is fine. It, again, it's staying off. It, they're just saying, we're not, we're going to stay off the mess. We're not trying to figure it out. We're not going to commit our future to anybody right now. And that's what the that's what a Baker signing kind of does or a Darnold move. Like we're talking about the Vikings kind of does it's or the Geno stuff. It's this kind of world that this middle ground, these competitive middle ground, the upper middle class of the NFL. That's what these guys <laughs> are going to fill out. Um, so this well, makes total word, sense. you saying that I think is a good way to frame it because this yeah. is for the first time. It does feel like we're developing a middle class of quarterback contracts again. The Geno deal. This is similar to the Jimmy Garoppolo deal that was signed last year. Obviously, that was a bad contract, but it was still in this same Same range. type of signing. Yes, exactly. So the fact that we have these now where if you are the 15th to 20th best starting quarterback in the league or even lower than that, the 20th to 24th best starting quarterback in the league, that's not on a rookie deal. This feels like the natural place where those contracts should land. And we really didn't have that space for guys over the last three, four five years. And this is where we, a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this, is that we think of everything in just numbers. Oh, 16th best quarterback. Well, that means the 17th must be bad. 
because it's below 16. Sometimes there's 22 workable quarterbacks in the NFL or mm -hmm. 24. So that's what we're saying is that this is that realm of 14 to 22. You know, it's really more, it's not really 14 to 18. It's 14 to 24 ish quarterbacks that have work in that range. And this is, this is one of them. And this is the, this is what you have to one. pay when you're not punting on the position. That's it. This is the yeah, going yeah. rate when you are not yep. punting on the position. And I yep. think that is totally fair. The, totally my fair. only concern with these quarterback deals, if you're going to sign one of these is that you are again, cutting off avenues for future planning at the position. Where if you do, you know this guy's probably not good enough to make you a consistent contender every year, but you've committed to him for three or four years, which is where the Vikings were with Kirk for a good chunk of that mm -hmm. time. That's a dangerous place to be, in my opinion. But if you are giving yourself flexibility and ways to wriggle out of this if you eventually need to because you understand where you are and where you want to go as an organization, that's fine. And I think that <laughs> this deal does exactly that for the Bucs. Absolutely. NFC, man. At, speaking of markets at the position and shifting markets at the position, my God, what is going on at the offensive guard market over the last two weeks? So this started, I mean, it started last week when the Rams yeah. gave Kevin Dotson that contract, but I think where things were going, the marker for that was the Landon Dickerson's extension that was signed earlier today with Philadelphia. So he signs a four year, $84 million extension. $21 million a year, $50 million guaranteed at signing. So that is just the, I keep saying natural upgrade. That is the next step from the Chris Lidstrom contract from last offseason. Which again, yeah, it's the, it is the evolution of where that was going. Totally fine. And, and I think that Landon Dickerson has been a good player. I, I get wanting to do this. This is very Eagles committing to this position group with your own homegrown guys. But the trickle down effect from where that was to some of these free agent deals that are handed out. I mean, Robert Hunt got five years, 100 million with $63 million guaranteed to go to Carolina. That is the Chris Lindstrom contract. Yeah. So that that's, but I guess this is what happens when guys hit the market. When yeah. you can get multiple offers, uh, this stuff ends up happening. So Hunt gets that deal. And then Jonah Jackson gets a three year, $51 million deal with $34 million guaranteed to go to the Rams. So teams are really willing to spend on this position specifically right now, what do you make of that? Do you think that's indicative of any sort of larger shift? Um, I think it's just where the money is available and also teams going, hey, where what, what just happened with all the defensive tackles that got paid as well? Who's blocking those guys on every that's, single that, snap? That, that's where I would go as well. I think it's, uh, we always say it too, and this is a, a term and I'm starting to really just think it's, it's best five, best five mm -hmm. offensive linemen out there. Not best tackles, not best, you know, center left tackle combination, not best left guard left side left tackle. It's best five. So let's just pay our five offensive linemen, divvy it up however. We'll skip a little on center or try and find a cheap one there, you know, because I think you, that's fungible. If you find so that right is how, as, yes. as the market has shifted over the last five years or so, there's been an increase for right tackles specifically. Right tackles yep. where the explosion has happened because pass rushers are going over the right tackles. Well, yeah, That's naturally, I think all yep. of us like five or six years ago was like, why do right tackles make significantly less than left tackles? Can, can anyone stuff. explain this to me? So yep. you can't. So that's why that has happened. And then as the explosion for the impact and the price for interior defensive defensive linemen, I think yep. we've come to understand that those guys can affect the game just as much. If you have a one on one with a three technique and a guard, how different is that than a one-on-one -on -one with a star pass rusher and a left tackle? So yeah. I think those markets have all started to converge a little bit. And also, it, everybody has a sub-rushing package now, where a NASCAR package. Everybody has, they line up Micah Parsons over your center or your guard. We would talk about that. Where is Micah Parsons or Miles Garrett lined up this week? That means they think that guy is the weakness. So again, you're getting your best five out there. If we have a short-arm guard that we're just hoping can get through this game, the other team's going to watch that. And they're going to line up this defensive end that usually you, defenses and defense, decent, uh, the best pass rushers usually just line up over the left tackle. It's used to how, how it was, you know, some snaps over the right tackle, but just the left tackle. Now you see these guys everywhere. You see Miles Garrett doing crossovers over the center now, you know, before the snap of the ball. You see those spinner looks and everything. You see the 5 0 looks. So that's what you have to do. That's just paying for your best five, best five blockers. I think Dickerson is a slight, slight overpay. Uh, for what it's a lot is, of money, 
a lot of money for who I think is above average to good and maybe not to the star level. Uh, maybe that's some of his namesake has gotten, but that that's a little rich. But I mean, I mean, having said that too, with seems like a decent pay compared to Robert Hunt as well, who I think is a fine starter, you know, good to good. But and man. that's the thought I feel like with Philadelphia, they wanted to get ahead of some of these deals because they, they're going to get crazy. Stuck I'm sure in. Dickinson Dickerson's people, if these numbers had started to trickle out before that deal got signed, would have said, well, if Robert Hunt's worth $20 million yeah. a year, what am I worth? Yeah. And I think Chris that would Winston's be probably going like logical hey. way to handle it. <laughs> they're probably looking around going, wait a second. And I mean, these are just some I, of the I guys wanted- that got signed too. So Robert Hunt goes to Carolina for $20 million yeah. a year and $63 million guaranteed. Carolina absolutely needed interior offensive line help, offensive line help, period, based on the way that that group played last year. Some people have been comparing this to the the way that the Saints built their offensive line when Drew Brees was there, just to give a little bit of space within the mm-hmm. pocket, which I mm-hmm. sort of understand. Mm-hmm. But Robert Hunt's selling point is not solid pass protection. His selling no. point is he is going to bring an ass kicking mentality yeah. to your entire group. And if that's what you're chasing, if you're Carolina, that's totally reasonable. But this idea that he's like a Jari Evans type presence in the middle of your offensive line, I think no. is a misrepresentation of what Robert Hunt is. He's a hammerhead. Yeah. He, yeah. He's the blow, which yeah. is fine. I, fine. I, I love, I love me a hammerhead, but that's, that's the type of player he is. He's getting, he's a uh, singles hitter. The guy gets on base getting paid like a home run hitter right now. That's, that's kind of really, he's getting that. He, it's not like Kalechi assembly when he got paid, you know, that you're not getting the highlights with hunt. It's good. Well, you are, but it's just in a certain way. It's a certain way. That uh, type of block. But even Kalechi, when he got paid, he had guard tackle versatility. Tackle versatility. And that was he, he was a really ascending player. So, I mean, that's a, that's a throwback in terms of what he got paid. I wasn't surprised when that contract got handed out, but no. the guard market has changed a lot in the God. How many years has that been now? Eight, eight years now? Eight yeah. Years. In the eight years since Clutch Assembly got that deal. Let's talk about the Rams a little bit because they have spent a ton on guards and free agency. And I think this is just a further indication of where the Rams are moving. Yep. Right. You bring in Jonah Jackson. He allows you to be even more flexible in some of the gap scheme run game stuff that you can do. And as soon as they sign Jonah Jackson, who presumably will be their left guard, Kevin Dotson, who they signed for $16 million a year last week, is going to be their right guard. Steve Avila played left guard for them last year and played it pretty well as a second round pick. He did all indications, according to Jordan Rodriguez and everyone else here that knows the Rams, is that Steve Avila at 325 to 330 awesome. pounds is going to be moving to center with these two guys next to him. This instantly becomes like the most ridiculous ass kicking trio on in the interior, I think, in the entire NFL. It's so much beef. It's awesome. It's crazy. It- it's great. Uh, the way it's going to look is going to be insane. So you have a couple centers in the league. They're very tall, right? Yeah. So Mitch Morris is very Ragno. tall. Ragnow is very tall. Yeah. Pochich is very tall. Yeah. But you don't have somebody built like this no. playing center. This would be like if Landon Dickerson moved over and played center. He's which bigger he than did at Alabama. He's bigger than Travis Frederick. That's, yeah, that's he's bigger than that. Travis Frederick was like six four two three twenty. He's bigger than that. So that's if that's we're looking at the way that the league is shifting, right? When we had all these tiny little zone blocking centers yeah. to what the Rams are doing right now. This is a harbinger of the, the way meta. that offenses want to play in this moment. It's the best. It's the LA teams. Now that Harbaugh's going there are going to be the ones that have the gritty styles. Uh, <laughs> it's great, but the, it, it's huge. They went from, and this is the, the meta transformation that the Rams offense. This is what we've talked about that they went through this past year. They went from, the team that runs zone one of the most over the previous, you know, four ish five years under McVay to the team that runs duo duo is power without the polar. That is as it's as at you as you can get. It's all about beef. Why does my dad love duo? Why do I like duo? It's because I was around offensive lines that had a lot of beef. You know, who was the center of those Vikings teams, Matt Burke, six, Huge. four, three, yeah. 15, you know, like uh, Dave Dixon was one of the guards, you know, like just guys with a lot of size and, so I, this is, this is all what you need to do. So I, I love this. And again, this is a, we're, we're seeing all these massive defensive tackles, athletic defensive tackles, just kick these smaller guys, 290, 300 pound inside guys, because they're athletic enough to beat them athletically along with the size and the mauling ability. All right, let's get some size to actually just move them. All right. All the integrity defenses. of the pocket, it, I it. think is becoming yeah, more and more of a consideration. And also the defenses want to do all the shifting and moving and getting defense, uh, defensive line, or I mean, sorry, linebacker types onto the ball. All right. Which is road grade, which is outsize them. So that I, I really like what the Rams are doing, starting with last year. And this is just a continuation of it. 
another team that's done this that we've talked about a lot that I think is also worth mentioning with this mindset is the Bills. Okay, yeah, so the Bills, yes. they go get Osiris Torrance in last year's draft. They sign one of the Connors, who's I'm not going to try to figure out which one to play left guard for them. Great bit. And then this offseason, I still don't know. And now they're all playing center because the Bills have moved Connor McGovern, I think it is, over from left guard to center after moving on from Mitch Morse. Mm -hmm. And now David Edwards, who was on one of he was on the Rams previously, is yep. going to slide in and play guard for them. So that's another shift that has taken place. And I remember talking to Brandon Bean about this last su summer. Because we'd always discussed, is this a transition to more physicality in the run game? And when I was asking him why they wanted to do this, again, it was about integrity in the middle of the pocket and not having Josh have to essentially dodge traffic cones every single time he was back at, driving back to pass. So it seems like that has been one of the considerations with a lot of these teams that have made these moves. So Makes the sense. Rams offense now essentially set, right? Yeah. You got Demarcus Robinson that you brought back, Puka, uh, Cooper oh my Cup. goodness, Cooper Cup, whose name I forgot. Cooper Cup, they're going to uh, tender Alaric Jackson, who played left tackle for them last year. Did nice job. You have yep. Jonah Jackson at left guard. You have Avila, Kevin Dotson, Rob Havenstein still at right tackle. Mm -hmm. You still have Higby, and then they just signed Colby Parkinson, who is yes. a guy we really liked. Was a Great secondary piece, yes. very good blocking tight end, very well-rounded. So this is your 2024 Los Angeles Rams offense. And, and based on what they did last year, I, I think it's easy to get excited about this group. Pretty, pretty stoked. This is leaning into what they're doing. Like they, they totally are realizing, okay, well, this works. And they got, it's not just like, oh, we're signing this guy for an identity shift. It's like, no, these guys are actually good. Like Joan Jackson's a, literally a Pro Bowl level talent. He's just said, like, yes. you know, he's injury stuff, but he's talented and he's powerful. Uh, but Colby Parkinson's a legit good blocker. I, I have clips of him one on one Miles Garrett pass protection and run blocking. And Think of him more as a guy that's going to spell Puka and Cooper Cup, if, if yeah. more, more two tight end looks. So it gives him versatility, which is and guys, okay, he's also now a good Cooper, athlete. So that stuff yep. like coming across the formation, like the way Cross that they want to play, down. he aligns with that sort of play style. This is so. good signings. These are really good pro signings that match what they're trying to do. You know, which makes sense for what the Rams have done the last couple of years. So the only thing I'll say is that I expected the Rams to use some of this newfound financial flexibility or just newfound resource period on defense. to bulk up the defense. Yeah. And the fact that they have <laughs> not gone that way and they still True. have some, you know, they have a first round pick this year for the first time in 20 years. They still have some money. If they want to move money around, they can, mm -hmm. you know, Joe Noteboom has a $20 million cap it this year. I assume he doesn't see that. Uh, there are certain guys that they can restructure if they wanted to move some of Stafford's money around some danger in that because of his age, obviously, mm -hmm. but this is not necessarily the direction I anticipated them going in the first four hours of free no. agency, but that doesn't mean I'm not excited about it. No, it's the same feeling as when the bills did their stuff last year going like, Oh, okay. Like, all right, that's interesting. Yeah, no, I like it. I like it a lot. Even the a step down from that top tier of guards, Graham Glasgow goes back to the lions after they lose Jonah Jackson, three years, 20 million, only nine and a half million dollars guaranteed. So that's probably a one year deal. You compare that to kind of what Ezra Cleveland got from the Jags, mm -hmm. which was, eight million dollars a year with 14 and a half million guaranteed and then john runyon formerly of the packers gets three years 30 million dollars with 17 million dollars guaranteed from the giants so this is even trickling down to that next group of guards it just right. seems like teams are willing to pay for one high level play at the position but even willing to pay a tax for competency when it comes to interior offensive line play right now specifically a guard it's like four. Yeah. Yeah. The competency. That's what it is. It seems like it's four to $5 million per tier break. That's kind of what I'm breaking it down as, you know, that's, that's kind of what seems like the pure tier break. So if you're a so at replacement level starter, that's what I'll call it. You know, you're a starter. That seems to be eight to 10 million a year. Yeah. You know, that's, that's Ezra Cleveland was available right. for a six round pick last off season or at the trade that I done last year, six round pick. And he just got 14 and a half million dollars guaranteed. Yeah. 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 It helps when you go with your former old line coach. <laughs> we'll get into some of the other Jags moves here in a little bit, but I oh yeah, we will. To a team that <laughs> another team that had an aggressive set of moves today, including the Landon Dickerson extension. I did not expect the Eagles to be throwing money around in these areas specifically. Let's start with the Saquon Barkley contract because this was always a thing about Philly over the last couple of years is that they seemed content to just rotate through these cheap backs. I mean, the guy mm -hmm. I threw out last week on the show, when we were talking about Fitz, I was like, oh, maybe they'll go for a Zach Moss type in free agency this yep. year. Instead, 
Three years, $37.8 million with $26 million guaranteed for Saquon Barkley. If you look at Jonathan Taylor's deal last year, four years, 42 with $26 million guaranteed. So with the uptick in the cap, this is a slight devaluation from what Jonathan Taylor got. And I just didn't know if that sort of market would be there for these guys. But the answer right now seems to be a resounding yes. Yeah, this, this, I mean, obviously I thought Saquon would be the one that got paid age, pedigree, talent, skill set and everything. But yeah, again, the suitors or this suitor was not really the landing spot because like you said, the, what they did with Swift last year made a lot of sense. And even Rashad Penny got the signings like that or the trades like that made a lot of sense to me where it was like, oh yeah, yeah. Day three picks, get some guy on the last year of his contract, maybe second last year, some guy that keep it moving, just keep it moving. We invest in the old line. We draft the trenches every single year. This, this is why we invest in Jeff Stoutland. and this is why we do that. And it's interesting because if there is the natural drop off, and there will be a drop off going from Jason Kelsey to however they work, they work out the rest of their middle of their offensive line, is do you get the more boom busty type running back, which Saquon is, to compensate for that? He maybe is not on the tracks as well as some of the other guys are, but do you get him to compensate for? The bad, you know, maybe a miss block that happens more often on the interior of the line to make uh, be the explosive play when maybe it's not going as great as down to down and all that. So that was the one as I've talked myself a little bit more into it. It's like, okay, I can understand that because he's how DeAndre Swift is kind of like that little boom busty. Saquon's a better version of it. So mm-hmm. maybe that's maybe it's just that was the line of thinking as well. But this was just not expected. It, it's I'm very, very curious how it's going to look too. Do you buy that thinking? Because I think that th- that no. thinking is totally fair. Okay. Right. If this is me trying to see that yes. from Jason Kelsey and I, I, who, they're they're a oh, right. They, Cam Jurgen, Jurgen, right Jurgens is now game. moving to center. So yeah, now yeah. Jurgens moves to center. You have a hole yeah. at right guard. So now you get right. Tyler Steen or however you piece that together. Yeah. So the set of downgrades that are going to happen from Kelsey and arguably the best line in the league, trying to talk yourself into we need a running back to carry more of that load. I guess I can track the thinking there, but I it. still don't necessarily buy it. I think it's a huge premium to pay. Having said all that, <laughs> I do think that I would much rather have some middle pick. And, you know, I think I've seen some tweets on it and saying, oh, this is a reflection of how the running back draft looks, you know, or this year's running back class looks in the draft, which I kind of disagree with. I don't think there's a top end talent, but I do think there's six to seven very workable backs that you can find in the third or fourth round. So maybe even eight. Um, I, I also hate that line of thinking. I the too. idea that there's not too. a running back available in this draft, so I'm going to pay draft, $8 million dollars a year on a running back, I, I do not Warren. like that. Jaren we'll get to other Jaren teams Warren that did the exact ago. same thing. So that's why I, I don't agree with that at all. This is not quarterback, receiver, left tackle. You know, it's running back. You can find guys always. There's always running backs in the banana stand, especially, you know, late day two, early day three. The other side of this that I just don't know how I feel about the fit is one of Saquon's main selling points is what he can do for you as a pass catcher. Right. And have we seen any evidence from who the Eagles have been over the last couple of years that that's going to be a staple of their offense? And maybe no. that is a scheme thing. Maybe the transition to Kellen Moore and maybe a little bit more of a traditional mm-hmm. passing game, mm-hmm. a more traditional approach will push them in that direction. But all of that stuff is a projection and speculation as it currently sits right now. Yeah, it, it just seemed seemed very rich and seemed very idealized thinking. I, I think that's what that's what that's the signing really felt like to me. Same. Yeah. Even like, again, I, I, even the Dickerson thing to me, it was like, Ooh, that's, that's rich. I get what you're trying to do, but it's still just, it was a little rich for the talent level. And I get, you want to pay your homegrown guys. It's like, Ugh. Let's get to another curious move. The Philadelphia yeah. made today, they signed Bryce Huff three years, oh, 51 million with $34 million guaranteed when they already have Hassan Reddick and Josh sweat and Nolan Smith on the roster. So what right. this signals to me is, we're open and this has been reported for the last two weeks they're open to trading some of those guys let's say you get i don't know what does Hassan Raddick have left on his deal is it just one year right he's in the final year of his deal Mm -hmm. so what do you think Hassan Raddick goes for on the trade market a third third, a fourth maybe fourth yeah he's older too right 20 so he's 29 okay so so you're i think the the thought process here if you're philadelphia is we're getting three to four years younger, right? Bryce Huff's only 26, I would assume. And we get a pick as part of this calculus. Again, it seems like a lot of moving pieces to wind up in a fairly similar spot. You're projecting Bryce Huff to go from a 40% snap share to 65. So that is something that you're having to extrapolate a little bit. 
So even if the thought again is, well, we can get a little sweetener with a pick if we move on from Redick for a similar price to get younger at the position. Mm -hmm. I still think that that's just a lot of moving around some deck chairs. I, I don't really understand it. And also, I don't think it's an idealized scheme fit for uh, what Fangio wants to do. Uh, yeah. So they don't the outside linebackers, the roles. OK, say say for sure. I think Redick will be gone. They, I think they have it makes to. more sense because his yes. skill set aligns more and usage aligns more with, with what Huff would do than what Josh Sweat does. And I'm about to, yeah, this is we're about to pull some uh, house of cards here because, like, okay, so have to keep Sweat then because why I'm saying that is then if if you don't keep Sweat, if you move on from both, and you're going with Nolan Smith and Bryce Huff, who I I, I like Bryce Huff a lot, but again, this is two undersized players as a designated pass rusher who has never played more than 480 snaps in a season. You think of him oh, as a one to one. It was that low. 480. And that was last year. All right. All right. So <laughs> if he's a one to one for Hassan Reddick, Hassan Reddick coming out of Temple and even as a pro was, oh, he could play coverage. He could rush the passer. He's turned into a good, very good pass rusher that could do some coverage stuff as well. That works for the Sam role in this defense. That's why he blocks snaps from Nolan Smith so far okay so say you put nolan smith and nolan smith's about 235 pounds okay so you have a 235 pound guy at one side and then you have a designated pass rusher at the other side that's never played more than 480 snaps he played 132 snaps against the run last year bryce hop did okay not really liking that the outside linebackers last year for the dolphins were bradley trubb at 270 pounds jalen phillips at 265 and then Van Ginkle was the Swiss Army knife. He's about 245. Okay, so that's yeah. one guy. One but guy. But that's, that's the that's Swiss that. Army knife. That's that the Swiss is Army the knife. situational, specific skill set sort of player. Yes, that's our that game. You don't want guy. three of those. No, and playing every single snap. So they have to keep Josh Sweat because if he, they move on from him, this is untenable. As they are structured right now, you know how he's never going to sit still and do all that. But it's just to me, it's, ooh, this is a little dicey. And you have no linebackers to cover that up. You know, and, and Jordan Davis is Jordan Davis not playing very well. You're putting a lot on this. To, okay, 480 snaps. Son Reddick played over 800 snaps the last four seasons. Half. Bryce Huff hasn't played, has played half, more than half of that once in his entire career. So it's just a, it's a little dicey if you want to go one for one, even if I really My like this. My thinking here is we're just trying to get younger. Yeah. That is like the main goal. A lot we of just have to get younger and more explosive on defense. Yep. But that coming at the edge rusher spots and not in the secondary right. where the age is really what seemed to be hurting you last year. That is the curious part about this to me. It, it Can you like trade game. Darius slay and try to get younger at corner? That makes sense. It, that, that's, that was what I maybe had expected. You know, where they are surprise team at the corner market, even though they're committed to these guys, because that's where they needed to get younger. But apparently they're going to try to pull off that same magic act up front. And I don't know how that's necessarily right. going to work out for them. And I'm saying that Bryce Huff can get after the passer. Don't get me wrong. It's He's just a that great, great, great player. player for what he is. It's just, just, this I is had, a projection. I had more questions going in than I thought, like with this landing spot and just all the other stuff that's coming out of Philly right now. Just, all right. He's played 1300. Uh, snaps in his career okay Bryce Huff Max Max Crosby played like over a thousand last year just in one season like this so that this just I'm just again bringing up the snap levels of, of these guys are getting paid uh this is just one of those moments where the notes absolutely make no sense but this is just how it all rolled in yeah Michael Pittman getting an extension with the Colts earlier today we don't have to spend a lot of time on this three years worth up to 71 million dollars 46 million dollars guaranteed this is exactly where I would have assumed he would have landed, and I think where he should have landed. Right. If you look at the AAV, the actual AAV, and the, the guarantees, this is essentially just an evolution and a markup from what Chris Godwin and Mike Williams were getting in 2022 as those 1B receivers. Mm -hmm. Those guys were three years 60 with 40 million. This is three years 71 with 46 million guaranteed. So I think it's totally fine. It is a natural place to land if you're the Colts. It's a natural place to land if you're yes. Michael Pittman. All parties can be happy about this. We get to move on. That's it. He's 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 the innings eater at receiver. It's perfect. I I think and this is where T Higgins is going. I'm not that. I'm the step up from that. I think that's, that's exactly it. right. And that's I think that's exactly right. Higgins. He's going. I'm not two. Uh, you know, a one A or one B. Or I'm sorry, I'm not two. I'm a one B or really a one A is what he's probably arguing for. So, so T Higgins yeah. today the, comes out that he has requested a trade after mm -hmm. being franchise tagged, which I understand the why he's frustrated as you see the market start to explode and some of these deals yeah. handing it out. I would assume, and this is not based on any sort of 
real knowledge or talking to people, but from the outside looking in, I would think that him and David Mugulata, who is his agent, are looking at, for a markup on that Debo Metcalf tier from a couple years ago, not on the Chris Godwin, Mike Williams tier. And that's before we even get to the limitations on guarantees that yeah, the yeah. Bengals put on their deals and the fact that they're not, not going to put it into year, year three in the same way that some of these other teams might. So this brings me to one of the questions I wanted to ask you. If you're Cincinnati, what do you think the best path forward is with T Higgins if, based on the tension that we're seeing right now? Based on this tension, it feels like a trade because it, it just, I mean, it just feels like a lot of feet dragging going on as opposed to the opposite going like, we're trying to get this done. It's kind of gone. I, I, I don't know. I, from the Bengals end, I should say. So I, I to me, it's try and get that weight first <laughs> and try and get off of it. Uh, I mean, that really, that's to me, that would be the best path forward. Even if it just doesn't feel right, even if you do have the money, it feels like, but it just, to me, it just seems unworkable at this point. So let's say not knowing anything this by year. The way. And again, <laughs> and, and, I, and I don't think a lot of us do know because here, mm -hmm. my, I've, I've asked this question a lot over the last few weeks, even as we've talked about this, you and I have talked about this. Like, why can't they afford T Higgins? Yeah. Like, why, why is this just not doable? And I assume it's because his people want to go to a place with structure and money that the Bengals just aren't willing to go to. Fine. If that's the case, I think your best move, if you were Cincinnati, is to trade him if the price is right. Okay? So let's play out this hypothetical. You're Carolina. You have very few pathways to difference-making receivers. You have no first-round pick. You're sitting at 33. If I called you right now, and I offered the 33rd overall pick to the Bengals if I was the Panthers. Would you do that? Uh, yes, if, if you can not find somebody ahead of that. But that's first pick of the second round? Yeah? I think I would do that if you're Cincinnati. Because the yeah. reason you wouldn't do that is because you're talking yourself into the window that you have right now. We can win right now. I don't want to move on from him because we have a chance right now. We still have this nucleus together. Like We have to maximize this. That is such a narrow needle that mm -hmm. you need to thread. If you can move on and get real draft capital for this, instead of theoretically maybe getting a third round comp pick for him a year from now, which I think is even slightly misguided because you're going to have a ton of cap space. You're probably going to sign some free agents. So there's no saying you, there's no, there's a chance you won't even get that comp pick. I think having a real draft pick in my hands right now to kind of take the next step of this to potentially find a receiver. At That's that range okay. of the draft, I think that is the smartest move from a team building perspective. If you are the Bengals in this moment, even if it's a tough pill to swallow, because yeah. in your mind, you've had, oh, we're going to keep this group together. We're going to squeeze everything we can out of this. But I think you have to be realistic about making a decision for the next three years and not making a decision for right now. It's keeping the options open. It's it's building new paths. Now you have two picks, two high, high picks, and you know, th that you can just do stuff with in a class that has stuff that you need offensive line and receiver and especially at those types of selections where they are in the late teens and if they had theoretic theoretically pick 33 or say, say some pick in the late 20s and all that so i don't know i i feel like this is to me it's like get it now and we're also seeing like the brian burns is of the world we're seeing when you don't pull that trigger on these deals what can happen yes. on the flip side of all that so sometimes i know markets are always hard to time it right that's why the stock market exists because no one can time it ever time it right. So, but I think it's, right it's now hard to, it's, it's, it's a hard. tough pill to swallow because again, you're kind of giving up a little bit on the idea you had for what sort of team you wanted to be this year. Yep. But I think teams that have been willing to do this, it has benefited them. Think I about agree. the chiefs getting a second round pick for D Ford in a really similar situation. What the chiefs are doing with the Jarius Sneed right now, Kansas city moving on from Tyree kill. These are not easy choices to make because you're giving up the idealized version of what you thought your team was going to be in right. that moment. But I think eventually two, three years down the line, it's going to benefit you. If you're the Bengals losing him for maybe nothing next off season, that's harder to stomach in my mind yes. than losing him for a second round pick right now. Especially since you've already paid Joe, you already paid Burrow and you're going to pay chase no matter what it seems like. Okay. Well, this is, this is the way to have your cost controlled contracts. This, this yeah. is what, this is stuff. You, it feels like a sacrifice, but it's not really a sacrifice. It's just opening up a different window. It's a different way to replenish your roster. You just have to think of it that way. It's moving stuff around, moving assets around. Would you do that if you were Carolina? Oh, yeah. 
because uh, it be just it's a lock thing, guarantee thing. The injury stuff is a little concerning with me with Higgins, it, of course. And he that, did that's not play one. as well last year when he was right. banged up, and it's just and that is an important data point to mention it here is. as we're having this conversation. And again, the, and that's another thing. Uh, Carolina to me is maybe not the perfect home because again, it just feels like a Carolina move as opposed to maybe just getting a young guy and you know taking a chance there. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I they may or maybe not my favorite landing spot for him, but I understand if they do want to go down that. There, I think there's better options too. You know, yeah, there's better options for the Panthers in that range if they wanted to draft the receiver. Yes, and better options for uh, Higgins' landing spot. Ones I would just ideally, you know, ideally like better. Which ones would those be for you? Could uh, you know, if they have that pick, could Jacksonville could do something, some, some interesting there? <laughs> so this is this this conversation and this cost benefit that teams in this range, so late first, early second, are going to have to have with T Higgins. This is where the wide receiver saturation market conversation becomes really interesting to me, because at the top, it's not real. You're going to pay Justin Jefferson $35 yeah. million a year. You're going to pay CD lamb $35 million a year. True stars are true stars. They're yeah. stars. And then I think the, the second, the third tier has settled naturally. Gabe Davis getting $13 million a yeah. year. Jacoby Myers getting 11. Like that to me feels like the right range for that type of player. So what is going to happen from $19 million a year to $24 million a year? Is that the group where teams are in that position? The Jags, the Bills, mm -hmm. the the uh, the carrot, the Panthers, for example. They're going to say, you know what? Our our picks from twenty five to thirty five. I'd rather take a swing in the draft than spend twenty two million dollars a year on one of these guys. So that to me is where the inflection point may happen. And I wonder if T Higgins is a canary in the coal mine for that a little bit. Is it overpaying for the B plus? Or drafting maybe a B minus, but he could ooh, he could be a B plus, or he could be an A minus. Or you know, like look how many receivers receivers look come at from Rasheed Rice last year. Look at yes. Rasheed Rice last year yes. compared to what you would have had to spend on the free Absolutely. agent market for a player that would have filled a similar are, role. Quote unquote, DeAndre Hopkins or Rasheed Rice. You know, now it's like yes, DeAndre. That's Hopkins. a great comparison. Hopkins right signed now, for thirteen million dollars a year last year. Essentially, yes. that's the exact yes. range that we're talking about. That's it. Is all right. We going for that? We know what he is, but he's not that star anymore. He's that B plus type type of player. Or do we get this guy that can grow into that role? So let's move on to another team that made some several moves today. That is the Green Bay Packers, officially moving on from David Bakhtiari. That always seemed like the natural end point. They needed to yeah. save some money. He had a forty million dollar cap hit. With so that saga ends at the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Bakhtiari <laughs> moving on, and then. A fascinating set of moves at running back. The Packers signed Josh Jacobs to a four-year, $48 million deal with $12.5 million guaranteed. That's what Beller has in here. So not a ton of low risk in the sense of the mm -hmm. guarantees up front, not very big, but still a sizable deal for Josh Jacobs. After signing Josh Jacobs, the Packers release Aaron Jones, yeah. who had a 12 or so million dollar cap hit this year, and they had talked to him about taking a pay cut for the second straight season, apparently, understandably, not interested in that. Now he is gone. What do you make of this? Because we've had a couple of these where yeah. teams are trying to get younger at the position and they're moving on from a guy to spend at the same spot. This one, I, we could kind of pick up some breadcrumbs. They were in on uh, Jonathan Taylor last year. Mm -hmm. It seemed like they wanted to add a little bit more size and maybe some youth to that running back room. I just didn't expect it to unfold like this. I, I think LaFleur wants his true three down guy, which Josh Jacobs is. He can play all three downs. He's a good pass catcher. Uh, even if the Raiders kind of didn't use him that creative creatively uh, last year, at least for the first half, he was kind of a slow starter last year too. Like kind of a, you know, and then they kind of came on a little bit. The Raiders offense was nothing to write home about for about six to eight weeks. It was then, a you know, bad ecosystem, but at the same time, he had a significant you know, just... step down from what he was in 2022. Yeah. And that's, I have figuring out what you said, if it's the ecosystem, if it's him, if it's a little bit of both, you know, he also had a lot of trails terrors from the year before. That was a lot of touches uh, that he had mm -hmm. from the year before. So again, you're getting into that. I think it's a little different. Him and Saquon kind of how their usage was, was always kind of a little different. You know, he takes a lot of, also, Jacobs can do a lot of things well, checks a lot of boxes. I'm sure LaFleur is going to love him because, you know, just because of all the stuff he does, he's good in protection. He's good as far as like what types of runs he does. He's kind of like a clean runner of the football. So I understand why the coaches like him. It's a flip down to a younger guy. It's a known commodity, which some pedigree and everything. So I could see that. 
again, it's a little rich, but I don't know. I'm not going to like split hairs about it. It's not that much money, you know, in the grand scheme of things. And it's, it's a not, you're saving downs. money still on running back or still yeah. a quarterback. You know, uh, Jordan Love is a 12 and a half million dollar cap at this year. You've spent no money on receivers. You still, I think you're going to go into next season with the cheapest wide receiver room in the entire league. You're spending <laughs> two rookie deals at tight end. If you bring, if uh, I assume they'll go cheap at left tackle, either with Rashid Walker or somebody in the draft. Yeah. So a lot of premium positions, they're still not spending a lot of money. So maybe that's the argument for it. But I think it's pretty telling that they just wanted to get younger at the position. That being said, yeah. Aaron Jones can still play. <laughs> Aaron right. Jones still has a lot still to give. Yeah. And I'm actually very interested on where he could land and what sort of role he could be in in an otherwise pretty good offense because when we saw him last year, I mean, literally the last game that he played, he yeah. was still playing at a pretty impressive clip. Yeah. It's just getting being on the field. It's just that he's, yeah. you know, get, that's, that's it, but he'll find a home. Oh man. I know. I'm just thinking about him. He's a guy who can up with the Cowboys. That, I think that'd be yeah. perfect. He's yeah, from Dallas or he's yeah. from Texas. Yeah. So you, you right. go back to Texas. Guy. Yeah. So I, I would absolutely love that. And I think that he, that he provides them the type of skill set that you would potentially need. Yeah. Also want to say Aaron Jones is NF or Packers career worth eulogizing, like incredibly fun player from the moment they saw from the moment they drafted him. He was one of those guys that justifiably everyone was like, why doesn't he touch the ball more? Like he, he's one of your best players on your entire roster. Also all time dude, like yeah, truly one him. of the all time people that have ever come from the ever come through the NFL. And that needs to be acknowledged. Everyone loves him. Everyone loves him. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he'll find a home. Uh, everyone always talks about high, high, high standards about him or says high, high things about him. Other move the Packers made today. This one does make a ton of sense. Yeah. They are the team that went big on Xavier McKinney, formerly of the Giants. So we wondered if the Packers would be spenders at safety, what that would end up looking like. The answer is four years and $68 million for Xavier McKinney per Adam Schefter. I've got no issue with this whatsoever. Nope. They they uh, needed pieces back there, and I was willing to them. I was ready for them to shell out for one. The fact that this is where they landed, McKinney is a good player. Good player. This is. I was curious where he would end up because I thought he was the kind of the class of this safety crop uh, mm -hmm. for free agency. So, uh, yep, no, uh, I, 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 very versatile as well. Very versatile. He's he's uh, done a ton of stuff over the last couple years. A lot. So this makes sense, especially for their defensive identity shift. Yeah, no, this one, and they need kind of like a little vet back there too so i think this is a good one let's talk about a position that has cashed in here over the <laughs> last three or four days the defensive tackle market has had some sizable contracts handed out all not surprising and all completely justified in my mind christian wilkins headlines today four years 110 million 85 million dollars guaranteed to go to the las vegas raiders so this tops everything this tops the Quinn and Williams contract from last year. This tops what Matt Abike got. Yeah. And we said this about Wilkins. This is one of those guys that you can't find a reason why he's a free agent. There are so few concerns. The guy played more snaps than any defensive tackle in the NFL over the last couple of seasons. He gives you full three down capability. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he stops the run well. He has juice as a pass rusher. He's young. This yep. is just the Dolphins not having the flexibility or the money to retain him. So he ends up hitting the market and I'm not surprised at all to see him break the bank like this. And we always thought that the Raiders were a logical landing spot based on the money they had to toss around. And the fact that they did not have a defensive tackle on their roster, I think heading into today and some familiarity with Patrick Graham. So yep. it's uh, it, no, and this I think is their great... defensive line coach was also in a Miami match, for uh, like two years. That's experience too. Yeah. A match like, so like Tinder. Uh, no, I think this is no, I this is great. I can't wait to see him with Max Crosby. You get the Iron Men of defensive line. I I, I tweeted I hope, it. There's... I hope they could start playing a little bit less. That, that, right. That's my hope. hope Tyree Wilson come along. Bit. Malcolm Koontz is pretty good. Like no, these guys it's... have to play a thousand snaps a season. No, they anymore. got Tom Thibodeau as their defensive line coach. <laughs> They're going to just see every single minute out there. Uh, no, I I love this it's a good fit i think that defense can be sneaky good I would, we like what they were doing last year and i think just have that pairing up there if they both play the run really well max crosby and christian wilkins this is pretty awesome uh yeah he deserves to get paid like you said they, it was just a victim of circumstances why you hit the market but young can do a lot on defense can i mean shoot whatever patrick graham wants to do like as far as like because he's leaning a couple different things it makes sense so yeah really like this for actually for the raiders he could be a gap shooter if you want him to be yep. he could be a guy who controls yep. blockers if you want him to be he he is a good player and to get him 
to get a guy truly hitting his prime in free agency that is yep. a needle mover, those opportunities are few and far between. I think he does check those boxes. Before we move on to the other defensive tackles, so some news rolling in about the Raiders here. Sean Reed of The Athletic confirms that the Raiders have signed Gardner Minshew to a two-year deal. The numbers reportedly from Tom Pelissero, two years, $25 million, $15 million guaranteed for Gardner Minshew going to the Raiders. Uh, I had heard that he wanted an opportunity to be a starter somewhere. And this is the, you have an opportunity to be our starter level yeah. of quarterback play. So good for Gardner Minshew. And this gives us an answer on where the Raiders may turn at quarterback. If they end up striking out in the draft. That's what it feels like to me. It's like, okay, we always got Gardner. We'll always be confident back there. He'll get the job done. Gardner Minshew gets the job done. He's going to know what to do. He'll scramble a little bit. It's fine. It's fine. That, that's what it seems like to me. If we kick all these other cans and none of them really are, you know, fortuitous <laughs> with, 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 with what we want, we always have Gardner in his handlebar mustache. We always have that in the back pocket. He is the ultimate line to me of you could do worse. And like that is, that's, that's exactly what he is to me. You could do worse. He, he and so worse. I think if you end up striking out, this is, you have somewhere to turn. But in my mind, okay, you have Crosby now, you have Wilkins, you have Devontae Adams still on this roster, you have Colton Miller, you've got some pieces. Mm -hmm. I think this is the team where I would like to see them be aggressive to try to go get a quarterback in this draft. Because I think eventually you need to get on that path. Yeah. Like you've got some guys that you're already paying like, and some guys that are getting up there. You know, it's not like they're some of these guys are in their prime or even in the back half of their prime. So I think that some urgency to really get the overall plan started for this team is yeah. worthwhile in this draft. I think so too. And uh, yeah, like you said, just the build of their team and also a pivot point after if that build doesn't work, you know, if, if the quarterback works out too. No, I think they could be aggressive. Other defensive tackles getting monster deals here over the last week. The chiefs bring back Chris Jones, five years, $32 million a year, $95 million in guarantees. He bests the Aaron Donald contract. We were wondering what it would end up looking like, and he gets paid. I have no issue with it. I mean, based on his production and based on what he is for your defense, he has been the second most impactful interior defensive lineman in the league for several years. He was a defensive player of the year type candidate for me last year. We saw him turn it up when he wanted to situationally right. in the playoffs this year. Like He is still he one do that. of those guys that can wreck shit when asked. And this is what the going price for those guys is. This is truly elite defensive player, yeah. independent of position type pay. And I think that's the exact range of players that Chris Jones is in, even if he's creeping toward 30 here. It's the 99 overall pay. That's that's yep. what he is. Yep. And how the Chiefs are in the world of Mahomes and getting to do this, you know, the wonderful world of Mahomes is that they can turn it up. And Chris Jones is the closer. He is the Marion Rivera of the NFL right now. There's no one better. It, once, once that ninth inning starts, once that fourth quarter starts, you don't want anyone else on the field. Like like he watching what he did in this playoffs, he single handedly won the game against the Bills because of just how, with the pressure he put on against Deion Dawkins, who just got paid. Like that's what this guy can do. And I've made jokes about him against the run and all that like stuff. But the thing is, he's still freaking Chris Jones. And when he wants to crank it up, and he's gonna crank it up. It's just that he's the best, one of the best right now. So this is why you pay him. A fun moment for you, Justin Matabike. Hmm. Four years, $98 million, $75 million guaranteed. Congratulations to him, but more congratulations to you. As the president oh, of the Justin Matabike fan club for the last three years, this is a worthwhile and fun culmination for you here in this moment. And I'm sure next year they'll pay Rashad Bateman, and I'll, I'll get a twofer <laughs> at the Ravens, my Ravens player love. No, he, he deserves it. Awesome player. I went back and just was uh, – Kind of like did like a little two three game just going like okay is he worth the pay was it some of the scheme stuff yeah the scheme stuff did help but I just watched this dude wreck guards the entire year one on ones like they created one on ones for him and that's the types of dudes you pay and this is why guards are getting paid because of the guys like this that are three hundred ten pounds and shoot gaps and beat you at the, uh, in the blink of an eye so he deserves to get paid good for him. What he got from the Ravens, uh, I think it's already aging pretty well after the we saw the Wilkins deal. So it's and that's not surprising. Baltimore is very good at this and getting in front of it. And so this is again just a small markup on the Quinn and Williams deal. Quinnen was four years for ninety six with sixty six million dollars guaranteed mm -hmm. and forty seven point eight guaranteed at signing. Matabike four years ninety eight seventy five million dollars guaranteed forty eight and a half fully guaranteed at signing. The Quinnen deal already looks fantastic. 
Yes, and, it does. And what did and what did Dexter get too? Lawrence. Uh, so he he because he got paid too. So four they, years, 90, 46 and a half fully guaranteed, sixty million dollars with in total guarantees. That one looks even better. Yes, <laughs> a little a little different position, but they're like, oh my god, yeah, those look great. Get out in front, and and that's exactly how you should feel about the guard market as well. I mean, yeah. even if yeah, Chris yeah. Lindstrom wasn't his best last year, the fact that Quentin or Quentin Nelson and Chris Lindstrom are now making twenty million dollars so well. a year as Robert Hunt is, I mean, that's pretty damn good. Or if you have a guy like Tyler Smith now, how uh, like the surplus you have like that, yeah. uh, all pro caliber guard on a rookie deal, it's like that's what nailing those picks it becomes even more important now because of just the pay difference. And I think this again could influence the way that we maybe think about interior offensive linemen in this year's draft. Are that's there it. guys who are guards or? I don't know everyone's name yet, but the guy from, I think it's Washington who plays guard and tackle. Like Love if he him. ends up slotting Fontenu. into guard, right? Fontenu. Yeah. If he ends up playing guard for you and you draft him 13th overall, who gives a shit? Guards are making $22 million a year now. I mean, that's worth spending a first round pick on a guy. And the same thing goes for defensive tackles. Yeah. Yeah. If you're playing, it's about snaps. If you're if for defense, if you're at their 40 plus snaps offense, you can play on the field every single snap. Yeah, we're going to find value out of you. One more defensive tackle contract. Grover Stewart staying in Indianapolis three years, 39 million, I think, are the initial reports. I always assumed he'd be back. They seemed yeah. they were confident that they could bring him back. And so that's he's a nice piece of that defensive line rotation. He's 29. Uh, yeah, he's right. got this is his third deal. So, I mean, he's, he's 30 right he's, now. That's perfect because I mm -hmm. knows his age. Well, that that's so yeah. I think this, this makes total sense. Yeah. And I mean, he's just there. You could see the difference in their run defense last year when he was and wasn't on the field. So bringing him back, even if it's at a, you know, a, a decent premium, that's a good contract for a run yep. stuffing defensive tackle. Not surprising at all. Let's stick in the AFC South and let's talk about some of these moves from the Jacksonville Jaguars. Oh. Okay. What, what is, I'm oh. curious what your tone is here. Are, are you just like completely out on everything they've done over the last day? No. Like walk me through your feelings about the Jags I, moves here. I want to start. I want to start the Gabe Davis deal because of course they're the team that's nice. <laughs> Gabe Davis, Gabe Davis topped hundred yards three times last year. One of those games was against the Jags. I think it was week five, six catches, hundred yards and a touchdown. Uh, the next six games for Gabe Davis last year, after that 100 yard little top off, he had 15 catches for 170 yards and one touchdown combined in six games. Uh, he's the ex same exact thing that the Jaguars and Trent Balky did when Christian Kirk only had one 100-yard game in 2021, and it was against the Jaguars. Uh, only time he stopped 100 yards the entire season against the Jaguars. We're signing oh, up, Mar market setting deal. So for for so for over 50 million dollars a year, the Jaguars' pass catchers are Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram, Gabe Davis, and Zay Jones right now under contract. That's my tone right now. I know it's not crazy. They're not breaking the bank. It's not crazy. It's Gabe Davis is an upgrade, I think, over Zay Jones. That's, that's a lot of money to spend. That's a lot of money for Stephen Core on a guy. It's a lot of money for no. I didn't hear. Yeah, I didn't say Calvin Ridley in that group. The guy, only guy that's a true number one type. The, these, right, it's let, a lot of. Threes. Let me play devil's advocate here. Yeah, and yeah. Try to, and try to convince you of this. Okay. Okay. You signed Gabe Davis to this deal. What was our biggest issue last year with the way that the Jaguars pass catchers were deployed? They're trying to use Calvin Ridley as this true X within this offense, and it's driving me fucking crazy. Just get that guy off the ball, let him have some free releases, and let him go to work. And right. the moment they started doing that, we saw a better Great. version of this offense. So the problem was when they really drifted away from that last year was when Zay Jones was hurt. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this to me screams, we want a guy that we can just pop into that X receiver role, put him outside, make him our vertical target and not worry about it anymore. So this signals in my mind, moving on from Zay Jones, if they manage to bring Ridley back at some reasonable price and their receiving core is Gabe Davis, Calvin Ridley, who is now in his more natural position, Christian Kirk and Evan Ingram, even if they're paying a ton for it, I am fine if they ultimately land in that spot or if they try to go get some other receiver to place into this mix. Yeah. If it's not Calvin Ridley, if they use it there, if they try to do it in the draft, for example. Right. So that outcome with Ridley coming back specifically, I understand the path to that, even if it's a little bit more expensive and a little bit messier than it has to be. It's that, exactly. That's my justification for it. No, no, it's, it, it's an up, he's an upgrade over Zay Jones and it, he is, and it would be the same role. He's vertical. He can block. And there's things that Gabe Davis does well that I actually like for the Jaguars and what they need. They and why you need him to block is because Evan Ingram isn't blocking. 
and and Christian Kirk isn't blocking. And the, if you want a run game, what? All, this all the, the guys the, in certain positions aren't really playing the positions that you're no, asking them to. No, so you're always asking just, some guys to do some weird stuff in that. And offense. that's it. Their team makeup is just fragile. That's what this is. Gabe Davis does help to give them some flexibility. And I do like that, but you're paying a premium for this type of player. That's not really a needle mover. He just shores it up and he's a glue guy. And Calvin Ridley, if they bring that back, that's okay. But it's when I look at like, say the bills the last few years, it's turned out the Bills really needed a number two pass catcher. You know, yeah. and it was because Gabe Davis didn't step up to the role that they thought he would. And now the Jags are like, sign me up for that. And so that that is kind of just some of the thinking too. It's like, of course you guys pick up this guy. So that that's just some of the frustration for it. But I do like potentially for the role if they bring back Calvin Ridley or if they get phone and find someone somewhere else. Um, the Darnell Savage one, we'll see. I actually... I, again, I want to see Savage. Come in on slot. now. You have to be thrilled that there is another actually, Darnell Savage believer somewhere they keep around the doing world. This. The fact they keep that doing it's Trent Alki can't make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> they keep doing this to me. Even when they signed Christian Kirk a couple of years ago, it was so funny because we did the preview pod and we were like, who's like an under the radar guy that you want to like, maybe could get a sneaky big deal that you would like. And my guy was Christian Kirk. And it was like, okay, we do defensive line. Who's a nose tackle. And I did fully full to Koski. And then the next day, the Jaguars signed these guys. And I'm like, no, screw that. They overpaid for them. The same guys that I was hyping up. That's what Darnell Savage just felt like to me. It was like, no, not like that. Not there. But I like it in this defense with Nielsen. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious. Okay, maybe playing the slot as a blitzer. You know, Savage doesn't read the game that well. And I actually think that's, well, I'm a little scared because that defense is going to put him on. He's going to be in a lot of binds. So that's a little curious with that. But if you want to get versatile with him or creative with him, I, I don't hate it. So that one I don't hate. So I, I will give you that. So Darnell Savage to the Jags. Do not hate. I thought that, that the, the Mitch Moore signing was very smart. It makes total That's sense. It makes total sense. He's one of those players as a veteran center. So Mitch Morse was released by the Bills earlier yep. this week in a cost-cutting move. The Jags move very quickly to sign him. Two years, $10.5 million, $7 million guaranteed. When you look at what Andre James got, when you look at what Lloyd Cushenberry, I actually don't have the numbers on that. Beller, can you drop that into the doc when you get a chance? Look at what Lloyd Cushenberry is ultimately going to get paid, even though he's younger. Getting Mitch Morris at this price, even in his early 30s, I think makes total sense based on what the Jags needed and where the Jags are. You know, they're trying to win right now. Like They're yeah. trying to win the AFC East today or the AFC South today. So bringing a guy like Mitch Morris in to be a stabilizing force along that line. So now left to right, you got Cam Robinson at left tackle. Ezra Cleveland, who they brought back at left guard, Mitch Morse at center, Brandon Scherf on a reworked deal coming back at right guard, and then Anton Harrison at right tackle. So their bet is if we have more better center play, if we have better health across the board, mm -hmm. and that is gonna if that's what the bet that we're making. If we can be a little bit healthier and Morse can just raise the level of the line overall, which a good center does for you, right? Yes, takes yes. a little bit off of Trevor. I think that's the bet they're making up front as to why this is going to be better than it was last year when the offensive line was objectively a weakness. Yeah. Now, don't draft any linebackers and draft another offensive lineman for depth. Depth. <laughs> it's the thing behind your starters. That's what you need. So get another guy that can snap. Make sure he's on the roster as well. So that, that no, but no, I, I'm with you. It's that bring up the more stuff it makes me feel a little better every uh, and Cleveland's whatever, and Scherf is another year older, and hopefully he's healthy and everything. Harrison is it's a, a risky player. bet, man. To it's a very risky bet. If we're healthy, fragile. that's going to be enough. It is fragile. And I think that they they understand that they were a little bit too varied in the run game last year. They yes. need to streamline that a little bit. So I think they're aware of their issues, but the fact that Mitch Morris and retaining Ezra Cleveland are the answers to them for their offensive line problems, there is inherent risk that comes so. with half that. measures as fixes with that group specifically yes, yes. Uh, last move uh, the jags made that's we're talking about here sixth round pick for mac jones no issue with it whatsoever well yeah it's a backup whatever was a starting backup. caliber quarterback early yeah. in his career has shown flashes of like, totally workable play at the position he's making two million dollars this year that's so whatever i mean that's whatever. totally fine yeah i know yeah, he belongs in the league i know there's a lot of jokes about mac jones but he does belong in the league so Absolutely, yeah. he does. I'm surprised he actually thing, didn't have more of a market. It's so this is my concern here. What is going to happen with Justin Fields if Mac Jones went for a six to be a backup? Mm -hmm. And now we're running out of places for Justin Fields to be a starter. If Minnesota wants to go the 
cheap route without having to give up a pick, yep. which I totally understand. And whether the Bears be willing to trade the division anyway. So yep. if they go Darnold, Minshew is now in Las Vegas. Kirk Cousins is in Atlanta. Russell Wilson's in Pittsburgh. We're out of starting spots here very, very quickly. So there is a chance that Justin Fields goes to a place where he will be a backup. And what does the market for that look like? Trey yeah. Letts went for a four last year with more time left on his rookie deal with one more season than Justin Fields has. Justin and Fields more is obviously and more mystery more box starter. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that could be a good or bad thing, right? Justin right. Fields right. has shown more in the league, but there also is more of a defined opinion about what Justin Fields is. So we're getting to a place where I think people, especially in Chicago, are going to be disappointed with what that return looks like. I've this said this a couple of times over the last couple of days. What would Caleb Williams go for right now? Several first, a lot of first, several, <laughs> several yeah. first round picks. If yes. you're Minnesota or like maybe let's not say Minnesota, they're talking to the Broncos. He said, all right, you want to come up from 12 to one. What would it take? It would take 12 this year a first next year, a first in 2026, and probably more than that. Justin Fields is probably going to end up going for like a fourth or fifth round pick. Yeah. The yeah. right decision is being made. This is this is the correct right. way to handle the quarterback position. Oh, trip it over. I know. it's If this was a year and a half ago, I could tell you where he was gone. Oh, David Tepper was sending some third rounder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was, so you guys have been guaranteed to have that another third rounder from Carolina. That would have been easy, easy to add. I know you start looking at like teams like Seattle, you know, teams like that, yep. where it's like a, a, Hey, maybe we can strike gold and find some, another starter for cheap, uh, in order a, a Gino backup as well. So like a team like that is where my head starts going. Um, I think that's totally reasonable. A team yeah. that is looking for a little bit more youth, a little bit more upside yeah. of the position. Let's see what right. they have here. So something like that, I think, is the correct way to think about it. I've also thought just high-end backup for teams that have quarterbacks that it aligns with their play style. Baltimore, Philadelphia, yep. would they Philly be able to make a one. move like yep. that? So yep. I, I think that's the type of stuff we're talking about now. And again, that's a pretty big departure from what it seemed like might happen before some of these starting quarterback seats yep. started getting filled. Uh, let's stick in Chicago really quickly. Bears make two moves, including the first move of the day, going to get DeAndre Swift. <laughs> two, yeah, three years, up to $24 million, $15 million guaranteed. I, this is just a shrug for me. Yeah, big shrug. I, it, it's in line with what the market is for that position. Tony Pollard got a similar contract. If you look at what uh, Devin Singletary got from the Giants, yeah. it's a three-year, $16.5 million deal. So this is just kind of what veteran running backs get on the free agent market huh. this is in line with the miles sanders deal from last year but why why chicago yeah that's why, why i don't get I, you already I, have Khalil herbert you already yeah. have roshan johnson who you like them both round pick on last year like why and drop another I, I, uh, yeah i know i didn't get this one that he's got yeah. more juice than those guys maybe 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 you can talk yourself into him as a pass catcher in ways that those guys aren't just in terms of what he could do with the ball in his hands. If they didn't but, have one of Herbert or Johnson, totally get it, but they have both. And that, I don't know. And I felt like they could just drop another young guy in and fine, whatever, go on with that. I actually like the Roshan can pass protect too. I don't know. Yeah. It was just a weird landing spot for me. And I, I'm not the biggest. Swift sense guy. Me. I don't, I don't yeah. understand what the connection is. You know, yeah, again, he was weird. in the NFC North. So you had some exposure to him, but the fact that, Two, two things that I would look at here. One, the Lions moved on from him and then immediately spent a top 12 pick on a running back and, and. had spent money on David Montgomery in free agency. Okay. The Eagles move oh. on from him and then immediately sign Saquon Barkley to a massive contract. And these are two teams that think about value. They think about plans. I just, I'd be a little With bit strong weird. offensive lines too. Strong, very good offensive lines. Yeah. I, this is not going to be a deal that torpedoes this team. They've got a shitload of money to throw around. I just don't understand the motivation or the thinking behind right. it. He's a, yeah, Swift's a very, and I think Swift's a frustrating running back. Uh, his vision's not very good and he's, he's explosive. And so that again, it's like maybe those guys after time, you're like, oh, this is great. And then over time you go, this pass protection is not great. And, oh, you know, he kind of takes off the table as much off the table as he brings onto the table. That's how I assess Swift. That Again, that's why it just doesn't seem right to me, but especially how the Bears have been. I've been really liking some of the guys the Bears go after. It seems a lot of smart players, like a, a lot of players that were just like very like football savvy players is what they've been kind of going after. So that's why it was curious to me, too. Like Kevin Byard. 
right? Like the Bears yes, signing yes, Kevin yes, Byer yes, to a yes. two-year, fifteen million dollar deal, it make thing makes total sense. Total sense. That's a, in total line sense. with what I expected them to do over the last few days. Yes. The Bears trading a fifth round pick for Ryan Bates and getting ahead of the interior offensive line yep. market that was about to explode makes sense to me. The DeAndre Swift thing. I just never would have expected yeah. it in a million years. Yeah. Yep. Like you said, it's not crippling or anything. It was just, oh, things that make you go, hmm, kind of, kind of exciting. Let's get to some other team wide plans here. Washington, who had more cap space than any team in the NFL so much. coming into today. <laughs> Two signings thus far. They bring in Dorrance Armstrong, formerly of the Cowboys, can play inside, can play outside. It's yep. always been a personal favorite of mine. Three years, $33 million base, according to Nikki Javal of the Washington Post. The max is $45 million. It's fine with me. Yep. This is starter rotational level. starter yep. level defensive line play. This is a we're not wanting to pay Montez Sweat $25 million a year. Yep. Let's get a second round pick in Dorrance Armstrong for eleven. million. I'm okay with that thinking. I think you yep. need needle moving edges at some point, but I understand if you're going to be where Washington is right now, going this yep. direction. This is just a player. This is just a yes. tangible starter level player that we can play 40, 30 to 40 snaps and we're fine doing it. And, and we're, we're okay. not in a position where we need to be spending top pushing. of the market money on guys like this. Think of the it, other move they made. You're not pushing the sand forward. You're pushing it to the side with these types of moves. You're like, okay, we're just spreading it out a little bit. We're not. We're just not pushing it into the into the center. They box. needed guys. Like they they that's just it. needed they need some kind on that's this it. team. So I think that's what year the, one of a here. rebuild. That's how you have to look at them right now. But I think the move that also to me aligns with where their timeline is. Them being the team that was willing to spend on a Tyler Biotish and getting into the veteran center market. Stay Tyler awesome. Biotish, formerly of the Cowboys, reportedly three years, thirty million dollars. It very much in line with what the Raiders spent on Andre James. And this is yep. a guy who is, he's a veteran presence. He is a solid veteran center presence. When you are likely drafting a quarterback in the top five, I've always enjoyed trying to pair those two things together. So I think going this route makes a ton of sense to me. And operating an offense that he had to do a lot with his quarterback too, with, with Dak and stuff because of all yeah. the license that they gave those two. So again, eight to $10 million, that's the starter level interior guy contract. So this makes total sense to me. And and again, it's a stabilizing force. You're just kind of going, all right, we have competency, competency here as opposed to, hey, rookie quarterback. Go have fun with another like third rounder that we drafted. Okay, you two go figure it out against the. Well, Eagles it's funny you mentioned third rounders because Ricky Stromberg they drafted in the third round last year, and they're choosing to go this direction instead of developing him. And it's funny watching teams eventually land here because the Jags did the same thing. They took Luke Fortner in the third round to pair with Lawrence, and yeah. eventually two years later they're like, ah, fuck this. <laughs> like, yeah. Get me the guy who can give me a stabilizing force within the middle of my offense. Give me my Alex Mack. Give me yeah. yes. It's, it's, give me my Rodney Hudson. One more set of team. Actually, let's hit a couple more teams here. The Vikings today. Yeah. Uh, I some. Vikings. I think all of this stuff makes sense when you're looking at it. So that they are true. the team that ends up paying up for Jonathan Grenard. Four years, seventy six million, forty two million dollars guaranteed. If I were an impartial observer to this team, my first reaction to that, as Daniel Hunter is set to, set to hit free agency, would be, why would you let Daniel Hunter walk? and then pay a guy $19 million a year to come in and be an edge rusher for you. If you look at the Vikings over the last year, the two moves that they made in free agency last year, essentially, they signed Marcus Davenport and Byron Murphy. Mm -hmm. If you look at the ages for those guys when they hit free agency, it's very notable. And then where did Quasi Adolfo Mensa come from? Cleveland. Yes. What has Cleveland done systematically over the last three, four, or five years? Babies. They are... They are so young all the time. So going from a 29-year-old, 30-year-old Daniel Hunter to a 26-year-old Jonathan Grenard, I think that's all you need to know about why they would be motivated to make this happen. And they like the injury discount a little bit. Like they they try to mm -hmm. find some some, and that's fine. I, I'm I've been fine. Excuse me, uh, fine with that. You know, sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes it does, and you get a little discount there. Just a you know a few million, but it matters. Uh, uh, Grenard's a good player. What? Uh, just good to get a lot of things. Good against the run. Good pass pass rusher. Played 630 snaps last year. His next season highest is only 413. So again, it's like he hasn't played a huge role because he's gotten injured over his career. But the thing that I like about Grenard, and this is the thing, it's a intangible thing that really matters. You're paying this guy. He plays really fucking hard. 
and yes. that yeah, I'm paying the guy that I love him. Set the I would have bet on him player. every single time in this free agent market. Yeah. And he's 26. Like you said, you're getting him and you're paying in this prime. And so that's the window that you're paying. So again, these are the calculated risks. This is what the, the premium I think to me is the injury history that you have to pay on him, but he's a good player. That's going to play a lot of snaps and plays positive snaps. He's a winning football player. Uh, and I think in the locker room on the field, all that type of stuff. So it's one of those and with hole with other stuff that they did. It was like, Oh, okay. I, I, I'm sure we'll talk about it in one second, but I, I like this one. It was one that like, it makes sense how much they paid for him, the type of player and everything. If you look at the way they use their edges last year, the Daniel Hunter was kind of that ace on the ch- queen on the chessboard ace, whatever you want to say. They moved him around yeah. a bunch, but he's a pass rusher. He's yeah. going to rush the passer 95% of the time. That is his role within that defense. That's what Grenard steps into play. If you go to the other edge spot, DJ Wanham was who is a traditional edge player. Like that's yeah. what he's been his entire career. They were asking him to do all this wild stuff within that defense last year. He tried, man. He acquitted himself pretty well. He did. For the most part, I actually he think did. him in coverage, dropping back and all the things they he asked tried. him to do. I thought he did a fine job, Agreed. but it always made sense for them to chase a player who more naturally fit that skill set within this system and the guy that i had pegged last year last week when they were talking about this was andrew van ginkle he's a connection to by to brian so, flores he fits this role specifically and that's exactly what they did they go get perfect. andrew van ginkle two years 20 million 14 million dollars guaranteed it's the only thing i'll get right this entire free agent period but i am happy that i got one the the dutch Army knife, him and Van Cal Van Noy. <laughs> they, no, but that, it makes it all the sense in the world. Uh, hey, in a defense that's going to have a couple guys kind of just do everything. Hey, you're going to rush the passer. You're going to drop into coverage. You're running with the receiver on this play. Van Ginkle is amazing at it. Like he he's played off ball linebacker. He's been a pass rusher. He sets the edge. He's perfect. This makes again we were talking about it's that he fits in a lot of different defenses. You can't go more different than Flores and Fangio. And what he's played in. And so I think Flores loves that versatility and all the things he can do. Makes total sense. I love these two signings for what this defense wants to be. I, I really like them. What do you think together. about Blake Cashman for three years and up to 25 million? Uh, they did that uh, as well today. Yeah. Okay. With that. And he's a blitz boy. So I make, again, it makes sense for his type. He could be the Drew Tranquil uh, for Flores a little bit. You know, it could be that he, again, he's a specific type of player. This type of defense makes sense more for him than I think actually Houston. So I actually like his role better in Minnesota. It's actually an interesting comparison that you bring up because but Tranquil, Drew Tranquil yeah. also got extended three years, 19 million. So pretty much a similar range yeah. for those two guys. And again, I think that we've, we've seen, we've talked about this a little bit over the last six months or so as we were watching the season unfold and as we were thinking about what the free agent market would look like. The fact that Tranquil was available for next to nothing on last year's market and now is worth three years and 19 million. You can't just punt on linebacker. You don't have to spend at the top of the market, but you need workable players at those positions. So I think that second, third tier of off ball linebackers, we're seeing that get pushed up a little bit yep. as teams are coming to that realization. And I think a guy like Blake Cashman coming off what could be a one year wonder season, but he played well is one of the benefactors of that. And and also well, a guy who's benefiting from that. We're an hour and a half in. I don't know what words mean. It's anymore. all right. I know. I looked at the clock. I was like, yeah, day one, baby. Uh, no, it's it also specific type of defenses, too, and how guys can really be unlocked in certain roles. So it's like, again, too, like a, a Tranquil and, and a Spags defense. It's like, oh, yeah. And we saw glimpses of it before, you know, Staley used them in a unique way too. And then with the chargers too. But again, when you get these guys in certain roles, it's like, oh yeah, you truly get unlocked with that. And like you said, you need bodies. Just like we talked about guards, you need starters. You need starters at linebacker. Otherwise the other teams are just going to pick at it the entire game. One more team wide plan to discuss here. The Titans three signings, they go get Tony Pollard on a very similar deal to the one yeah. DeAndre Swift signed. Again, I like these, these uh, deals for running backs. I just, they, I'm unmoved by them. I, I just like, oh, I, I, my reaction is just kind of like a shrug. Yeah. And also, Paul, like, that's an identity difference than I expected. That's not a Pollard landing spot to me because I thought they kind of Titans were all about tough guy stuff. So we kind of, Pollard is a, he bounces a lot of things. So him and Spears together, Tajay Spears, like, I don't know. The fit there didn't make a lot of sense. I like Pollard in different places. That one, that one was curious to me. For him to be the innings eater with like an explosive option like Spears, I, I that's that's it is a curious yeah. pairing. So yeah, we'll see how that works out. But they uh, two more signings. They're the team that goes and spends for Lloyd Cushenberry. We still don't have the terms on that, 
yeah, I assume fine. it's a pretty sizable deal. But again, you're pairing a second year quarterback, or if you've end up moving on from Will Levis and trying to draft another one, a rookie quarterback contract. Well, well who knows? This is a new coaching staff. Yeah. Like who knows how that ends up shaking out, but you're pairing a young quarterback, no matter who it is over the next couple of years with a guy who has now become a veteran center, yeah. really yeah. good in pass protection, very smart, can handle all that stuff for you. And they also go and get Chidobia Wuzier, who I was curious what his landing spot would be because he was banged up last year, but we've seen him play some very good football over the last couple of seasons. I still think he's a starting caliber corner, like above average starting caliber mm-hmm. corner in the league. So I think that's exactly what the Titans are getting with a guy like that. And again, familiar with Brian Callahan, et cetera. Yeah. I, I like the cushion Berry signing a lot. Uh, again, that was the, the weakness for them. So you got Skaronsky at left guard and maybe they draft a, a left tackle. So now the, I think the offensive line becomes a true strength. Uh, I, I, I like, I like cushion Berry. He's like the, he's the line of, I think everybody above him is a good center and everyone below him is an average center. Like he is that exact line for me. Like he's that level that he's the Kirk tier uh, for centers, but he's smart. And I bet you Bill Callahan is going to love him because mm-hmm. he's going to just be able to handle everything. So like you say, that's, this is a true opportunity to take a lot of load off the quarterback. So yeah, I, I like that one a lot, actually. Something to hit on with the news kind of rolling in right now. Sounds like, according to Diana Rossini and some others, there is some real smoke brewing here about the Panthers and Giants and a Brian Burns trade. Mm. This makes sense when you look at the Panthers cap situation and the Panthers needs and where they should probably be investing. And I also think the Giants clearly need another edge rusher. The Giants have uh, cap space to burn. So trying to chase a guy like Burns, I think, makes a lot of sense. My the, my ideal outcome here, if I'm the Panthers, whatever I pick I get for Burns, I'm flipping that to Carolina to go get a T. Higgins. Like I'm using the Brian Burns money for yeah. a receiver or for receiving yeah. help because of where you are with Bryce Young. Yes. And that's why they should have done this two years ago. <laughs> this is well, and this is what uh, why I've been frustrated with Jacksonville for all these years because I always thought load up on the offense. Well, not like this, how you guys did it. It was like true, no, true guys, like actually. But this, I always just think that you shore up your star quarterback, get into shootouts, whatever, <laughs> put him in two minute situations all the time, but make sure the offense is okay in a good ecosystem. And then we'll, you know, as we used to say, Bengals the defense, you know, down the road. I, I, I don't know. I think that's the team yeah. building plan itself, but help out your star number one pick that you just took and traded the, you know, a boatload for. Yeah, you drop Brian Burns onto that front for the Giants. Now you have Brian Burns, Kayvon Thibodeau, who, you know, he's been fine. Yeah, and Dexter bit, Lawrence actually. all in that group. I, that is a pretty formidable trio. It's pretty and again, if you're the if you're the Giants, I think that's exactly the mindset you should be in. You know, can you trade? I guess it would be the 38th overall pick to Carolina for mm-hmm. Brian Burns and would be willing to give him an extension. I think that's a totally reasonable move Absolutely. for the Giants specifically. It's a true uh, star. Uh, put, yeah. So you put a star next to another star next to Dexter Lawrence. Yeah, that, that's a great. And you got intriguing Deontay, uh, Deontay Bakes, the corner. Like, yeah, I, I really like that, uh, especially with Bowen, too, going there, defense coordinator. So one more pass rushing note. Sounds like Leonard Floyd is heading to the Niners. I don't know exactly what the numbers are on that. Here we go. Ian Rappaport, two years, 20 million worth up to 24 million, 12 million dollars guaranteed in year one. So, okay. okay. The, this year's Chris Kassura career rehabilitation plan belongs to Leonard Floyd. Uh, they always needed another edge rusher. I was wondering how much they were going to try to pay up for one. Uh, yeah. The answer is they wanted to land in the Leonard Floyd tier, not in the Daniel Hunter, Jonathan Grenard, yeah. whoever tier. You made it. You made it sound like the Chris Kassura, you know, rehabilitation plan. You made it sound like the special scholarship, you know, to like a special. You know, it like is. School. It really is. But it's like, yeah, that's the Chris Kassura. You know, uh, <laughs> who's the first one? It was, uh, what's his face, uh, from the Jaguars? Uh, and it's not with the, the, oh no, I'm blanking on his name right now, but I mean, anyways, there's a, there's a ton of them. That there's been 20 of them. Thing. I know, but I want to name it after him. You know, it's, a, it's like this last week and it was the, uh, Wake Forest has the Arnold Palmer, Palmer scholarship, you know, for, for their top golf scholarship. This would, that's what it feels like for Chris Kasarik, the 49ers defensive line. A few more smaller ones here. Uh, the Texans continue to shop in the same bin that they've always shopped in in free agency. Love this bin. When it got to Nico Autry, they signed Jeff Okuda on a short the 199 DVDs. Deal. That's they love those 199 DVDs. Them, I and I, I don't mind it, right? So, them no. going and getting Fatu Kasi 
after he gets the monster payday from the Jags and is yeah. now available at a discount. I think that's exactly how you should think about free agency if you are these teams. Or even they they try to they pick up Tier Tart after he got cut last year. Uh, yeah, exactly. Titans. Like they're trying. Exactly. Oh, like that, I love this. I love this. Find it, especially this type of that type of position too. So no, it totally makes sense. Couple others here to uh, to tick through. The Chargers make a couple smaller moves. We were wondering what that Chargers running back option should look like. Gus Edwards going to the Chargers to play for Greg Roman <laughs> makes total sense. So I mean, sense. It, 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 it's obvious. It was just sitting there. We probably should have known that was likely yeah. going to happen. And then Will Disley going to the Chargers on a three-year deal. This is a team that just needs workable tight ends. Yes. You know, it's, it's that's, that's been the case for the last couple of years. A uh, couple others: Cardinals three smaller moves. Bilal Nichols. Justin Jones, Sean Murphy bunting all on just starting caliber yeah. free agent contracts, which I don't mind. Like I'm they just, just need starting caliber players. Curious what the Cardinals are doing. Just every move they make, I'm going to be like, oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. So what you guys see in that guy? Last one here. Uh, Gino Stone goes to the Bengals. Two years, oh. $15 million, $8 million in year one. So the Bengals clearly just looking for another answer at safety. Uh, they went with Nick Scott last year. Clearly did not work out the way they wanted to. So you have the Jordan battle Dax Hill combination. So I think this is just the next guy in the mid tier starting caliber secondary market that the Bengals have consistently shopped in here over the last three or four years. It's, yeah. It's sweet Lou going, give me my vet. Yeah, hey, he can, he can call a defense. Yeah. Sweet. This is great. That's exactly what he wants. And Von Bell now also on the market after yes. reportedly being released by the Panthers. So he's somebody worth paying attention I to thought as they well. Would, I thought they would maybe, you know, bring them all back. I, I'm sure that this, the conversation with Geno Stone probably started before that news about Von Bell had even crept out. So I think, so. think Geno Stone going there makes a ton of sense. They're very familiar with him. They needed just mm -hmm. one more safety to drop in there. So I get it. Makes all sense. right. I think we've hit most of this stuff. Frankie Lugo to Washington. That's the last Frankie, one. All right. What do you think about this? Frankie Louvre going to Washington. Need players. That's fine. That's good. Uh, he hey, what, uh, He's a uh, Bruce Irvin type. That's, that's, hey, who Dan Quinn used to coach. There we go. So, I don't know. It's a player. He's a good, solid player. All right. We are, right now, it is 4.36 p.m. Central, 5.36 p.m. Eastern. So, when you guys are listening oh to this and you're wondering, well, why didn't you hit this? Why didn't you talk about this guy? We have to cut it off eventually. Have so, we will be back tomorrow doing this again at the same time 4 p.m eastern right here on youtube please come back and listen to that if you're listening on the podcast same idea the show will be up as soon as possible after we're done recording tomorrow so just something to keep an eye on but uh very exciting very fun day one of free agency i'm still waiting on the bears to get their edge rusher that's all that matters to me right now and all i will be paying attention to or thinking about over the next 24 hours or so but uh, hopefully you guys had fun. I know we did. We'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same place doing this all again for now. That's all we got. Appreciate you guys listening. We will talk to you soon.